you know, one of the first things that popped into mind while you're reading my bio is uh, this is a really generous gift to give your community because over the next hour before we open it up to, to the Q&A, you're going to hear, you're not going to hear me talk about products or investments. You're not going to hear me talk about anything like that. So when you said that this is really education, it's really adding value to your client relationships to help people where they're stuck. Uh, people are going to see that. They're going to see that really right out of the gate when we dig into this issue of estate planning. It is a subject that Canadians have struggled with. Uh, we know that because 12 million Canadians don't have a will. I mean, just close your eyes and picture what that looks like. Yeah. That's 12 million Canadian adults over 18 are missing the most important document that will help their family not just navigate what happens to their assets after they die, but 12 million Canadians missing documents that will help their family guide them and serve them when they may have dementia or other types of cognitive diseases. Um, so this issue is crucial. In an, and it's urgent. And so when I say thank you for bringing me on and sharing my message to your community, I, I truly mean it. Because if we can, over the next hour, change a couple of people's lives, give them the confidence to move forward in this area where they're stuck, uh, that's been a great day. That's been a really good day for me, and I know it will be for you. So yeah, let's, let's dive right into this subject. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Um, look, I, uh, I, I have my own here and I got a, got a few tags along here that we can talk about today. <laughs> but uh, really, the, the first one, which was uh, right at the start, was you'd said to my grandparents who set the gold standard for caring for my grandparents. Certainly, I'd like to hear a little bit about that and why that was so important to you to be at, uh, at the open. Yeah, I watched my grandparents take care of my great grandparents while they were aging and ultimately when they died. I watched my parents in their 70s taking care of my grandparents, my grandmother, especially in her 90s. She died at 98. Wow. Um, and that really framed and informed my perspective of, of what, what estate planning is. When I say that my parents provided the gold standard for my for my grandmother. Uh, I mean, I really mean it. Uh, the, it was unbelievable the amount of effort and energy that they in their 70s were spending driving my grandmother around medical appointments, making sure prescriptions are right. And are you ready for this? Spending $150,000 a year for in-home care a oh. year. Now, really high, in, really high quality care. Yes. But that was $1.5 million for 10 years. Wow. There's a lot of Canadians who are underestimating how long and how expensive it is to age and then ultimately to die. Yeah. It's changed. It's yeah. changed profoundly. That was in 2011. That 150000 is more like one seventy-five, dollars $180,000 now a year. Wow. 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 So when when did your family start talking to you about these kind of things? When did, uh, I'd say these kind of things like wills and I guess kind of the family, I know it was fairly early for you, but I'd be, I'd be curious to maybe explain that a little bit. Yeah, so in the book, I talk about the, the role that family meetings had in, in shaping my view of this subject and just our own family culture around our, our relationship with wealth and money. Yeah. And, um, and so my first family meeting, I was five years old. Uh, I'm 58. I've been to 50, 53 consecutive family meetings. I grew up in Montreal. We would meet at the MAA downtown Montreal and our advisors would be present and we would have these very business-like meetings. Uh, over the years, they've become much more informal uh, yep. because we're, we've kind of dealt with all the governance issues. We've all traded documents. Like all that stuff is kind of behind us. We've been at it so long. Hmm. Uh, but that's what I grew up with. I grew up with a lot of transparency around wealth. Hmm. And I came to learn fairly early on that that was quite out of step with, with most Canadians. That most Canadians treat their will if hmm. they have it, if they have one. Yeah. And those that do, the 12 million Canadians who do have a will, the vast majority keep them secret. Yes. And it's usually on, on death that there is this great revelation. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. great disclosure and everyone goes. <gasps> and, and that sound is usually the sound of surprise. 
someone got more or yes. someone got materially less. Yes. Uh, yes. yes. Someone grieved. Yes. Someone, something is like, that's the sound. It's often the sound of litigation. The family, <laughs> the courts, the courts in Ontario are absolutely jammed full of families fighting. Yeah. And, and, and it's, and I think we're better than that. I, I think as Canadians, we can do better. For sure. For sure. So I'd say maybe uh, for the audience, explain what happens to all those people that die without a will, maybe give some backstory around how that works within the system, how you've seen it. Certainly I've seen my share of them. I have a client that's uh, died in the US without a will and they have, uh, you know, six years later, their RSP is still sitting there waiting to be settled. So maybe you can, you can tell me a little bit and walk, walk them through what it, what it looks like. So what it looks like is, is, um, is pretty awful. To, I mean, I, I could sugarcoat this and say, well, you know, your families will ultimately spend time and work through it because the province of Ontario, the province of Alberta, every province has their own set of laws and regulations that deal with what's called the laws of intestacy. And that's when someone dies without a will. So when someone dies intestate, the provincial government has a formula for dividing their assets, whether that's a cottage, a canoe, a barbecue, a business, Right. And uh, and I would say that everyone listening right now would be less than pleased with that particular formula. Like the, the thought that that provincial government formula is going to make everyone happy. I mean, everyone's different. Yes. Uh, in many cases, if, if we have business owners, for example, that are listening, it will put um, brothers and sisters together as equal partners in a business. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, or it will take four brothers and sisters and make them equal owners of a cottage that, by the way, only has two, two bedrooms. And each of those four kids have four kids. So yeah. you tell me how 18 people are going to jam themselves into yeah. a two-bedroom cottage. Like, we, we set our families up to fight mm -hmm. and to fail yeah. when, we, when we fail to do the basics, and that is to contemplate our will, and then go the one step further, and that is to share the contents of our will. Yeah. And why do you think we do that? I think there's a couple of reasons. I think uh, I think there's a lot of superstition. Yeah. Okay. There's a, okay. There's a here's a guess what this is. It's Your my will. will. <laughs> I'm still here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still here. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of people who think if I talk to my family about a will, if I meet with a lawyer, if I write it, if I sign it, if I hold it, I'm going to be like begging bad things to happen to me. I'm like, I don't know. I'm nesting. It's, yeah, yeah, gonna, yeah. it's something is going to happen. And I just, you know, it equally ludicrous would be to say that if I have a will, I'm going to live 10 years longer. I mean, yeah. both are ludicrous. That's number right. one. Number two would be um, the subject is full of Latin. It's full of complexity. It's full yeah. of million dollar words. And I think people are intimidated by estate planning. People yeah. feel like they don't know what a testator is. I don't know yeah. why we have done this to ourselves, where we've created language like a codicil. Like, why yeah. don't we, like, that's a, it's an amendment to a will. Why don't we call it a document that amends our will? Right. So I just think there's a lot of intimidation. There's a, yeah. people, no one likes to feel silly or inadequate when they go visit their lawyer. Yes. And, and I just think, so that's, that's number two. And then number three is, there is a lot of fear of death. And I'm just going to put it right out there. There's, and I just think there is just, no one wants to contemplate this. We always say to ourselves, I don't want to write a will right now because next year I'm going to sell my business or so I'll do it then. I'm not going to write a will now because I think because our daughter is pregnant, she's going to have a grandchild. So I don't want to write a will because it'll be outdated. I'll kick it, kick the can down the road, procrastinate, yeah. delay, delay, delay. And I can tell you, oh my goodness, if you, if you die in test date, I don't know anyone, maybe you do. I, I don't know anyone who, if they don't have a will, they don't have a power of attorney yeah. and they don't have a healthcare directive. Yeah. Like you sure. go in for the will and you come out with those two bonus documents. Yeah. And, it, and it's those two bonus documents that are really about the living. And yeah. this is really what Willing Wisdom, my book, is about. It's really rephrasing what estate planning is. We have been led to believe that this is just. Estate planning is just about other people getting our stuff. What's right. the hurry? How yeah. much fun is that? Yeah. Right? I come along and say, oh, no, 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 no. 
listen, estate planning and wills, that is about you. Yeah. That is about empowering other people, power of attorney, to yeah. serve you when you lose capacity. Yeah. Don't you want to give yourself that gift? And I think when I think when that penny drops, I think people, I think that's a moment where people get a little bit excited about estate planning. I wouldn't say it's putting the fund back into funeral, but I would I would say that it is taking a step in the right direction and people yeah. feeling a little bit better about where they're going, not only as an individual, but as a family and how people can really uh, be empowered to serve, serve families. Yeah. So if someone hadn't done, you know, like you're starting from scratch, well, hypothetically say, so you're kind of saying, let's position it with, um, you know, the parents talk to each other. And then you bring the kids into the mix and then you expand it and you have a conversation about their life and their plan. And then you go to a will or how, how would you, how would you think about, uh, you know, if people haven't done, or, you know, they, they put a will in place, which I see for most clients, they had their kids, their kids are 25, their will is 25 years old. So, right. so where would they start now, for example? <laughs> I, I, they start by getting a copy of their will and reading it. And what they're gonna, immediately going to find out is there's been a lot of water under the bridge since that will was first drafted. Sure. Uh, let me tell you a short story. 1968, Bobby Kennedy takes a bullet in Los Angeles. That was a pretty horrific day for Americans. Yes. Uh, the good news is he had a will. The bad news? Guess who his executor was? Uh... His brother, assassinated yeah. five years wow. earlier, never updated the will. Yeah. So while people may be starting to feel a little inadequate or uneasy around where they are with their own estate plan, don't feel bad. I mean, right. this subject has eluded some of the most accomplished people. Yep. Four U.S. presidents died without a will. Two were lawyers. Half of all lawyers don't have a will. Yeah, yeah. Half of all business owners. Um, there will be more than one billionaire this year in North America die without a will. Yeah. So this is, it's not just necessarily poor or uneducated people who don't do this. Yeah. This cut, this problem cuts right across culture, ethnicity, income levels. There is a lot of apprehension around estate planning. Yeah. Yeah. That's for sure. I mean, I tend to get a lot of questions close to the end of people's lives. And by that point, it makes it a bit more challenging to do things. So, uh, you know, I certainly know and see some clients on here that they have, you know, parents that are in their 90s now and are starting to lose capacity. Um, you know, is there anything that can be done when you get to that point? Or what happens once uh, when, when you get there? This is why it's so, this is a great question. This is why it's so urgent because when we lose capacity, we actually lose the legal ability to write a will. So like okay. once that ship sets sail, when we lose cognitive functions, yep. we can't write a will. We yep. And if we do, we really leave it vulnerable to, to challenges by heirs. Yep. Right? So 98% of all wills that get challenged in this country are, are really as a result of someone claiming that someone made a late in life change to their will and they lacked capacity yes. or someone was holding their hand and had undue influence over the change of that will. So mental capacity and undue influence covers 98% of unhappy children who, who are aggrieved and uh, want the will uh, invalidated or, or challenged. And do you know, sadly, one of the fastest growing areas of estate litigation, are you ready for this? What's that? It's children suing charities because they think mom and dad left too much money to charity and they want some of them back. That's what happens when we have secret yeah. wills, no family conversations, um, someone, is, someone is lawyered up and that's, that's the legacy we leave. Yeah. A broken family fighting in court. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. No, I mean, as I went through your book, you you know, obviously you have the seven questions, which I think we'll probably cover some of those today. But, you know, the, the seventh question is the one that I 
typically recommend for people to make sure that they have the conversations with with their with their kids or with their heirs prior to the actual question reads describe in detail your last wishes so i certainly would like you to elaborate what you think about that we can go through some of the other ones but you know that's that's typically always been my advice you know if i'm leaving this to the this child and this to that child and some money to the grandkids i've always said to clients let's make sure that uh uh, you know, you've let them know in advance why or they thinking or how you got to that point. Um, because there's some, you know, you partly you want to feel good about it. And they want to feel good about it. And you've had the chance to have that conversation because when you're dead, you can't you can't have the conversation anymore. Yeah, no, it's a really great point, And it really underscores the importance of a family meeting because one of the big benefits of a family meeting is everyone hears the same thing at the same time. So in the fullness of time when someone dies and, and son Larry, I'm just picking on Larry, says, yeah, dad promised me the boat. He always promised me the boat. And, you know, if there's a family meeting, everyone would be like, hey, Larry, we were all in the room. Dad never promised you the boat. What are you talking about? Right. That is like that is the real benefit of a family meeting is that that transparency, that structure, that consistency, the family conversation, the reciprocity. I have a copy of my parents' will. They're 86 and 80 and 80. I, I have a copy of all of their documents. I can, my brother and myself can really serve them, especially when it comes to their power of attorney and their healthcare directive. Yeah. Um, but they also have a copy of my will. I mean, nothing yeah. says that we die in order. Right. So they have a copy of, so in our family meetings, we're sharing our documents. Our, our kids, 28 yeah. and 26, uh, also have copies of our documents. We have copies of their documents. Yeah. So when our kids turn 18, we buy them wills. Okay. They're, they're very disappointed. They're hoping for cars. <laughs> very disappointed children. <laughs> but we, and we don't go to the lawyer with them. We, okay. we pay the invoice. We say, you know, you're an adult now. 18. The law doesn't say, well, you're a young adult. We have different set of rules for young adults. Hey, 18, 81, yeah. 64. Yep. It's the same set of rules and laws. Okay. So I, I would say... If, you know, anyone listening today, if you really want to give yourself a great gift, uh, buy your kids a will. Yeah. Buy your kids a will. Uh, yeah. they'll, they'll think it's weird until they don't. Yeah. Um, and, and you may, you know, you made reference to that last question, but the importance of um, final wishes. Yeah. The reason that's question number seven, uh, it is the last question of the seven. And it's, um, and it's, it's really a question that has legal import. So the executor of your will has the legal authority and duty to implement your final wishes. And I talk about that in the book. I mean, there's no sense selecting an executor and not telling someone you selected them as an executor. I'll tell you right now today, there is someone learned, many, many people learning today that someone's died and they've been appointed executor. They don't even have a copy of the will. They don't, they never knew that they were selected yeah. and it's, surprise yes. and they don't know where the documents are they don't know where the title to various assets are like it is a mess yeah. and that is what we leave as our legacy people don't remember you know the business owner who built a great business and or or someone who you know developed you know wealth and worked on well they just leave chaos right and that is what they're remembered for the person who never really thought through the anguish, the chaos, the, yeah. and that's what we're trying to avoid, right? That's yeah, the yeah. gift that I know that you're trying to bring to your clients and to your, For sure. to your community. This, this sense of, this is what we do. When we understand that inherited wealth will do one of two things, it will yeah. release potential in the next generation, yeah. or it will accelerate demise. It won't equivocate. It won't kind of do one or the other. It will do one or the other. And yeah. I think we have a duty and a responsibility to really prepare our heirs yeah. for what is surely coming their way. And yeah. there is a lot of wealth that is trying. So today, $205 million will be inherited in Canada. That's $205 million today. Wow tomorrow and every day for the next 10 years it is a tsunami of money that is transitioning across the generations and yeah. most of it is is transitioning chaotically yes causing lots of confusion 
yes. and lots of aggravation. It sounds yes. crazy. How could money cause aggravation? Oh, trust me. We've all, I mean, a lot of people have watched documentaries on lottery winners. Sure. Sudden wealth, whether it's yeah. a lottery or an inheritance, it, it can be really destructive. Yeah. And uh, like, uh, like I think I've mentioned before, I think I've probably helped settle about 60 estates. And uh, I can't think of many in that pile that went easily or simply. There's very few. And so I'm hoping that we can, we can help people get pointed in the right direction. So, you know, maybe we could draw, maybe you could maybe draw a simplistic timeline for me, um, you know, from 18 to death, as an example of something that maybe you'd recommend, you know, you give your, your boys uh, the, the gift of a will, what happens next? Maybe we can, you can give me some of that, Tom. Yeah, so our kids are in our family meetings. So okay. I, those those family meetings are really crucial. That's that's really where we're we're talking about what okay. is coming their way. Okay, and we're preparing them for that. Yep. So we're the opposite of surprise. Yeah. Um, I mean, prior to COVID, uh, you know, I was doing a hundred live events all around the world, um, thousand page speeches, twenty six countries. I mean, I was on a plane with my wife, traveling with her all the time. Yeah. And God forbid something should happen to us then. Um, if it did, our kids obviously would have been grieving, but they would not have been uh, shocked by the wealth because my advisor is their advisor. Yep. My accountant is their accountant. So like that's deliberate and conscious, yep. right? Yep. And, and I know that you as an advisor can do your best work when you've got, well, Two generations is good, but yeah. three is even better. Yep. yep. Now, when you've got the grandparents, the parents, and the grandkids, and you've got that big, long family story of how wealth was created and how it's going to transition, I know that you can do your best work. For sure. Yeah. So you can you compare and contrast that to the advisor who just has one generation. Yes. Yeah. Well, ninety yeah. percent of inherited money packs up and moves to a different a different advisor because there's no continuity. There's no consistency or clarity or big family mission state. We have a hundred year vision for our wealth that, that our advisor had, has worked with. And I know you do this with your clients, yeah. but where do you want to be? Yeah. How do you want your wealth to transition? What would be, yeah. and it's fascinating. When yeah. you sit down and you sit with the next generation, instead of you know proclamations about this is my money and this is what I want you to do with it. Yeah. The kind of family meetings that I've attended both in my own family and as a speaker inside family meetings who bring me in to, to educate and to facilitate. It's fascinating when the person with the wealth says, look, I don't know what you would do with this wealth. It's question number three. Like, <laughs> what would you do with an inheritance? Right. So there's a lot of reciprocity when we listen to yeah, how yeah. the next generation may start a new business go in a different direction. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's fascinating. I mean, it yeah. should be fascinating. We've worked hard to create wealth. Yes. Aren't we a little bit curious about where it will go and how it will shape our children and our grandchildren? I think it's, it's extraordinary, I think, and exciting work. And yeah. I know that as an advisor, when you're in these family meetings, you see how surplus wealth can really deepen trust uh, and respect in that family. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, we've been speaking for about 30 minutes and, uh, you know, I know we've talked about wills a little bit, but, you know, as, as I get to sense of what it is that you're talking about, is you're talking about the family connection more than anything, these family meetings you keep talking about, um, you know, that's pretty rare. I mean, I know, obviously, you grew up in that and you've spoken with thousands of people about it. Um, and, you know, I've, I've met many, many clients with all levels of wealth. And it's still, it's still very rare that that happens. So, you know, I think that would be, uh, uh, maybe we could elaborate a little bit too on an example of what that family meeting looks like. Um, I mean, what, what do you do there? <laughs> so, so the really great news is there is, I've never been to a perfect family meeting. Yeah. They, they don't exist. Yeah, yeah. But I've also never been to a really bad family meeting. They're always different. I mean, yeah. every family is different. 
Sure. I've been in family meetings that have been in boardrooms, big oak, oak panel boardrooms and very sure. serious. Yes. I've been in family meetings where families have been meeting for years and years and years. Yes. And it was around a campfire at a cottage, very yes. informal. Yes. Uh, yes. But equally productive as yes. the boardroom session yeah. and everything in between. Yeah. I, um, I was a speaker in inside a family meeting in Chicago. Three generations were in that room, 17 family members. Wow. Guess who was chairing that meeting that day? A 15 year old girl. Awesome. <laughs> uh, they rotate the chair. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and so that, I mean, that family meeting, it's not about the people with the money. Yes. They, in fact, in that meeting, they were making themselves very tiny in the process. It wasn't about them. Sure. That was about preparing heirs and yeah. teaching them about wealth and using philanthropy to connect the next generation and the grandchildren, the third generation, about what wealth is and what it's not, right? Yeah. Really creating yeah. this healthy respect towards wealth and telling stories, right, about how that family created wealth what they did well and how they failed so it's yeah. not just it's not just the great business owner in that family meeting saying in yeah. 1948 i went to the bank and i only hit three dollars it was either eat that night or get a loan and i got the loan and i started a business and you know in just six weeks i created four million dollars like there's yeah. none of that it's, <laughs> it's actually your mother and i work really hard we bought used yeah. cars for 25 years. We, yeah, yeah. we ate a lot of pasta. Sure. Um, and, but, but you know what? There were good times and we were happy and we didn't yeah. have a cottage and we deferred consumption and we bought used clothes and, yeah. and we saved and we invested and, yeah. and we, we just, we deferred consumption. And they tell those stories and they embed those stories in the culture of the family. Yeah. Um, and and that, those are great gifts. And I would honestly say that the greatest gifts that my parents left me, my, both my brother and I inherited from my grandparents' estate, but a relatively small percentage. And I'll come back to that issue of generation skipping. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you the greatest gifts that, that I got from my grandparents were the stories, yeah. um, the stories of how they worked hard and, and what they did well and where they pulled up short. And I make the point in Willing Wisdom that how we leave our wealth is actually more important than what we leave. And I think when parents and grandparents make that investment and take a risk and gather family to talk about that impossible thing called money, yes, um, they, they actually leave just such an incredible mark and profound mark on, on their children, on their progeny. Yeah. Um, and that's really what I'm, what I, gets me out of bed in the morning, giving these public sure. lectures yeah. um, to really give people the confidence to start. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, I think uh, some of the stories I heard from my grandparents were the best too. And uh, I reflect back on that and they were hard, hardworking generation, I think. And uh, that's something that uh, is missed at times. So we've had a few questions come in, uh, Tom. So I just want to make sure we bring those in. Uh, one of the questions was, can the executor and beneficiary be the same person? <laughs> yeah, sure they can. Um, I think the selection of your executor is a great place to start for a family meeting. I often get that question. What would you, what would you tackle in your first family meeting? I think you could have one agenda item. Mm -hmm. That could be mom and dad saying, Hey kids, we're going to have a family meeting. Um, and we can, and by the way, the fact that one child lives in Montreal and another one in Vancouver is no longer an excuse not to have a family meeting. Look what we're doing now. Yeah, right? for sure. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, all yeah. of a sudden, we've learned yeah. that you know Zoom or whatever platform we're using is a great way to connect. We can yeah. have our advisors present in a half an hour. We yeah. can tackle like there's no excuses now. We can tackle these subjects, mm -hmm. and I just think really in an efficient way. So yeah. you can have a Zoom call. You could organize it and say, um, okay, we're just going to tackle one thing today, and that is uh, the selection of an executor. We've actually brought a lawyer on. He's just going to give a five, 10 minute presentation on the duties of an executor. Yeah. And instead of your mother and I proclaiming who our executor is going to be, yeah. we thought we would open it up and get, get your thoughts, our, our kids' thoughts. Right. And you see the shift in, the, in that 
the shift in the power there. Yeah. And, and so what often happens is after the kids hear the presentation, they're like, I'm pretty sure none of us want to do this. <laughs> It is a yeah, lot of people, lot of people think, well, first of all, if we keep our will secret and then when is, when is the will revealed? I used to think it was at the reading of a will. That was the big kind of drama moment. It was yeah, always yeah. movies. The sure. Will and all the <laughs> right. chairs were lined up. And yeah. Everyone yeah, sitting yeah. there and gasping. Yes. Actually, do you know where ground zero is for really a lot of estate planning dysfunction? It's actually the funeral home because, and I was speaking recently in Las Vegas at the Funeral Directors Association of America convention. It's, yeah. it's an enormous convention. Sure. All, all funeral directors. You ever go to a funeral and you see a funeral director and he's got his head down, he's wearing a dark <laughs> suit, looking very, very sad. <laughs> yeah. I have been to their convention. Yes. Yeah. They are not sad people. They're not sad. <laughs> they are completely out of control. They, they're actually really fun people. Sure. I mean, they're around death all day long. Yes. They are hilarious. Yeah. I go to their convention. I yeah. then go have dinner with the board of directors. Yeah. And over the course of the next two or three hours, I am taking notes like a wild man because they're telling stories about what has taken place in their funeral home over the last year. Yeah. And, and they tell a story. And I got to, it's only a couple of minutes. I got to tell this story. Three daughters show up to a funeral home. Okay, their father's died a number of years earlier. Now mom has died. Okay. And so the very first question that they ask, it's a legal requirement, is who's got a copy of the will? One daughter looks at the other daughter, the other sister, and says, do you have a copy? She doesn't have a copy. <laughs> she doesn't have a copy. So they say, look, we're going to go back to mom's home. We'll be back in 10 minutes. Shit. Go back to the home. It's not yeah. in the safe. It's not in the desk drawer. They can't find it. So what do they do? They start going into the air vents pulling the house apart, taking the drywall off. They dismantle the house. They can't find the document. Yeah. Give up. They finally give up. They go back to the funeral home. No will, no executor. Now, how do you want to celebrate mom's life? It's a committee. Good luck with that. <laughs> One daughter says, well, we want, I want to celebrate mom's life. She wanted to be buried beside dad. The other sister goes, I heard cremation. And she loved both the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean and want to remain divided in them. The other sister says, look, I heard cremation as well. But I'll tell you right now, if you divide mom's remains, I will never speak to you again. <laughs> now, did you hear me talk about capital gains? Yeah. Did you hear me talk about tax, money? Yeah. No. Those three sisters I learned never spoke again. Wow. And mom owned the largest manufacturing business in that small town. And because those three daughters couldn't speak ever yeah. again, yeah. the business failed and a hundred people lost their jobs. Wow. You started yeah. to see what estate planning is. Yeah. The stakes, yeah. when it goes well, it goes well for everyone. And when it goes yes. bad, it really goes south for a lot of people. Yeah. So I think what I continue to hear from you, Tom, is it's all about communication. And uh, I think that's probably the biggest thing that I've seen too, is that, you know, families don't communicate what, what it is they want. And typically when they want to start communicating, it's too late. It's uh, near the end. It's, uh, the, they're not as clear with what it is that they want and, and, and how they want it. Um, so, you know, the message I'm hearing is communication, communication, and uh, well, you know, you've done a great job and the, the book's excellent. I know you have a tool that, uh, we'll, we'll share with uh, clients as well later. And, you know, it's going to go through a bunch of these questions and, you know, I think point them into the fact that they need to start communicating with, uh, with each other um with the family um another question that we had come through was who who participates who is the family what, what, what is it that uh, typically is from uh, these family meetings um, i know there's no rules associated with it um, but who, who should you bring in there yeah so my advice is you know mothers and fathers start small the very first family meeting could just be your own children but as soon as you can expand out to include the spouses of your children, I would really encourage you to do that because they're, the exclusion of your children's spouses or partners, um, it's kind of a, it kind of is a statement, right? It's like, we love you, just not enough to share any information with you, right? 
And, and quite frankly, running parallel to estate uh, laws in the province of Ontario is the Family Law Act, mm -hmm. and your children's spouses have entitlements. So get your mind around that. And if you've got serious concerns about, let's just call it what it is, the yeah. spending habits of your, yes. of your children's spouses yeah. or addictions, yeah. by excluding them from your family meeting doesn't make the issue go away. Right. In fact, you can bring them into the family meeting. And I know this is gonna sound really awkward and really difficult <laughs> and really impossible, but trust me, um, you know, and I know that there are technical solutions to those problems. You can actually say to someone from a place of care and concern and love, you could say, we have real concerns uh, about your spending habits, Yeah. but we're still going to leave you an equal amount to your brother who has a Harvard MBA. Just because you've got, you know, some real, we have concerns. But here's the thing, we're going to put your your piece of our your inheritance in a trust yeah and and when the trustee if something happens to us when the trustee believes that you get healthy we hope yeah. you do yeah uh, you will be able to access the, the same amount of wealth that we transitioned to your brother the one yeah. with the harvard mba but you do you see do you know why our family would approach a family dysfunction that way it's because when we die and we we leave inequality we, we would leave someone projecting their dissonance, not yeah. on us. We're in the yeah. ground. They yeah. project it on the living. Sure. We, we set siblings up, to, even ones, the golden children, the children that are really ideal. Yeah. We set them up to receive lawsuits from the, from the children where we have concerns about wealth. Yeah. And so that's why I say the greatest gifts that we can give our children is the way in which we leave our wealth the way yeah. that we transition it, the way we bring transparency to those decisions yeah. to use trust yeah. uh, if there's concerns. Yeah. So it's a great point and something I get lots of questions about. You know, we have three kids. Uh, they all have different levels of economic success. Um, get this question often and they say, you know, how do you suggest we allocate the wealth? And so, uh, you know, it uh, it's a big challenge. So, is your have you typically seen that? I guess it's communication is ultimately what comes back to it. Eh? Tom, is that is that what you're telling me? It is. It is. So it really. I mean, you were right on the cusp of cutting right to the core of <laughs> of the of the essence of willing wisdom, which is yeah. do we do we decide on the division of our assets based on economic need? Sure. Yeah. Or, or, or does a quality and family values drive our thinking on how we divide our estate? Right. So uh, I can just speak from my own personal family. And it's not yeah. to say we're yeah. right and the rest yeah. of the world is wrong. It's just that yeah. in our family, a yeah. quality is like a touchstone. It is a cornerstone of our entire estate foundation. Can you imagine two, which is not to say that everyone gets a, you know, the dollar the same way. We got a, if we've got a cocaine addiction in one yeah. of our children and, and the other one is this Harvard MBA start making millions of dollars, we will leave them the exact same amount of money. One in trust, one gets cash, right? Fuel yeah. to go start great things, get yeah. healthy, yeah. get healthy. Yeah. And so, but what we don't do is say, well, you're a loser, you're a disaster child, you get yeah. nothing, you get yeah. everything, and yeah. then set our kids up to fight. That is not what we do. Yeah. Um, but it's the communication. It's the transparency. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. the transparency it, and it, and it takes work, but I'll tell you, it is work worth investing in. There's, yeah. it is, it's incredible work when families come out of these family meetings with a sense of accomplishment because they've sure. tackled something difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it's, uh, it's very true. It's very true. I think that, uh, a, a big challenge for parents that have wealth is to start and whose kids don't know about it is to, how do they start that conversation? So, and, uh, you know, I think of uh, clients that I've met over the years, they, they're just, they choose not to deal with it. So how would you start that conversation? So you got a couple million dollars, your kids assume you have nothing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I really, first of all, I would read the book. Uh, yeah, it is excellent. a very quick read. It's an yep. easy read. I've, I've yep. stripped all of that million dollar 
intimidating language out of estate planning to make it accessible so yeah. people can really figure out what the heck you know an estate plan is for sure and then i would sit down and i would encourage your kids to read the book and then start yeah. going through this i offer seven questions the subtitle of the yeah. book is seven questions successful families ask yeah so i would say have a family dinner go to a restaurant well yeah. we can go back to restaurants <laughs> and, and and tackle one question yeah yeah and i just i think it should be and it should be fun yeah yeah and um these are really these are really interesting questions i guarantee some of the most fascinating conversations will emerge from your family yeah yeah i think that yeah go ahead tom i was going to say that my favorite line in the book is is this silence is the great destroyer of canadian family wealth it's not families that talk about this sure it's families who wrap the entire subject of wealth and money yeah. in total silence yeah. and the consequences are devastating yeah 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 it's uh it's very true and so when you have your meetings do you do once a year you have the your financial advisor in there you have your accountant right. you'd have a lawyer is, is this what you is this how how you how you roll yeah. it out yeah correct and sometimes depending on the agenda we may not have the accountant there or we have them yeah. all there maybe sometimes we have the lawyer there it really depends on what we're tackling at a particular moment in time sure uh yeah you know, we we had a large manufacturing business we sold so that like the couple of years after that there was a lot of moving parts a lot of changes yeah. to our estate plan as we were moving to more liquid assets yeah so yeah so the composition changes but yeah we always have someone other than family in the room and i'll tell you that's what brings the business like right and that's otherwise it devolves into another family dinner right, right? exactly <laughs> we start talking politics and religion and you know, we, we we revert to our 13 year old selves it's hilarious. sure but yeah. you but you insert an advisor there yeah. with someone taking minutes and yes. with an agenda people yeah. behave yeah i mean uh people come out of these things and they're like i don't know you know what i hear more often than anything we should have did this 10 years ago i don't yeah. know why we didn't do this sure. sooner yeah. this that was great yeah i can't wait for the next one yeah so here's another thing that uh, I get often get questions about what uh, if I've written a will, it's 15 years old, do I start at scratch? Do I start adding codicils to it? What's a codicil? <laughs> like, well, maybe, maybe you can give me kind of your thoughts on that. Yeah, I will. First of all, what I would do is get a copy of that will, read yeah. it. Uh, yeah. Like my, my will here, there's just a couple of paragraphs that I have to read. It's just a double check. I, I read it. I always read it on my birthday, I, my will day. Yeah. Uh, I'm 58. So when I'm 59 and then 60, like I'm marching my way to the end. Right. Yeah. So my birthday is kind of a reflective day. It's okay. not just all about the presence now. Now it's like sure. oh, I'm moving into my 60s. Yeah. And I got friends around me that are dying. Stuff is happening. Um, sure. I don't know. So I just, it doesn't really take that long. Yeah. So, uh, and if you read your will and you think, now nah, maybe I, maybe I should get a, a total reset. Yeah. Um, yeah, take it to a lawyer but listen oh my gosh whether it costs you 500 or five thousand dollars oh my yeah. that is like that is the best investment seriously of your life right you have a badly written will or even worse you've gone to staples and got a will kit for twenty dollars and you've yeah. made a mess of your estate yeah. because you've had one of your beneficiaries witness and sign your will which makes it invalid um Oh my God, like seriously, you can mess things up. There's something, this is not like renovating your kitchen, like do it yourself. Yeah. Please spend a little bit of money. And I know that you probably work with a couple of lawyers or can recommend to some of the people maybe listening in, Certainly. right? Who are, yeah. who are who, where they can get a good, good value, but yeah. a good, well-written, well-considered uh, uh, will. Power yeah. of attorney and healthcare directive. You need all three documents. Yeah. And so once that's done, um, you know, the lawyer keeps a copy, you keep a copy, and then you start uh, sharing it out with the rest of your, your, uh, yep. I guess, network. Yeah. Yeah. Your team. Okay. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Yep. And yep. I have another set of eyes. Yeah. Uh, but, but really, uh, the executor is crucial as is the power of attorney. So mm -hmm. some people, their executor is their financial power of attorney. They, yep. They're the same person. Uh, sometimes they're not. Right. But there is no point in yeah. having these people appointed yeah. and not have the document. Like yeah. there's lots of executors who don't have a copy of the will. 
Yes, or of course. Financial power of attorney. Just to let people know. Yeah. The financial power of attorney is a document that comes into effect while you're still alive and on the planet. It just means like maybe you're a farmer and you're getting off your tractor and you bump your head and yeah. you're unconscious or you get COVID and yeah. you're on a respirator. Yeah. Good news, you're going to get better. But while you're incapacitated, yeah. you've appointed someone to, to write checks and keep your business going and act in your best financial interests as if they are you. Yes. You see what I mean about estate planning being very much about the living? Sure. So, right? So the financial power of attorney, make sure that whoever you have selected has the document hmm. so they can spring into action and serve you. Yes. Same thing with the healthcare directive. And that's really a document that really speaks to the issue of resuscitate, do not resuscitate. I have a copy of my parents, as does, as does my brother. Yes. We know exactly what to listen for Right? Yes. We're looking for very, very specific language because we've covered this in our family meeting. Sure. If we hear vegetative state, mm -hmm. irreversible brain damage, yeah. um, non-heroic measures, we yeah. will serve, we will serve my, our parents the way that they have empowered us to do that. Yeah. So compare and contrast that to the person who doesn't have that document and yeah. their kids are in the hallway of a yeah. hospital debating, no, right. fighting. Yeah. Plug, unplug. Yeah, 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 yeah. How, how is anyone ever going to feel like they, that they serve their parents, that they move too quickly, yeah. or, they did, or they let them suffer, yeah. that they didn't move quick enough because they didn't have the family meeting? Yeah, look. We, seriously, we can do better, and yeah. we must do better. Yeah, we have to. I mean, I think, uh, obviously, you're, you're an exception to what typically happens because I see it all the time too, as, as I'm sure you do, is uh, people aren't prepared for that. They aren't prepared for that conversation and it's very uh, traumatic in people's lives. So I think it's, I think your point's very important that you have those conversations that, that people know who's responsible for what and the decisions that, uh, that everybody wants, parents, kids as well. Um, so I think, uh, I think, you know, a lot of what we've covered today is around communication. <laughs> and uh, I think that's a big gap in, in uh, how families act. Yeah, and I would say that because we're having our annual family meetings, we are not a death obsessed family. We're not like, <laughs> God. what? We deal with it? Yes. And it's done. Yeah. We don't spend the rest of the year, right? Like we know there is a, a mechanism to deal with this stuff and it's yeah. communicated, the documents are updated and shared. There is no jockeying in our family for parental approval. Like it's just non, like all that nonsense disappears. Yeah. There, is a, there is a cultural shift happening right now where I think more families are having, there are absolutely more families are having the things that I've described. Yeah. We're just not reading about it. Yes. Right? We're not yeah. reading about a family who meets annually with their advisor to yeah. plan, organize their affairs and communicate with family members so that everyone's prepared. Who wants yeah. to read that story? That's yeah. boring. What are we <laughs> reading? We're reading about the families on the front page of the Globe and Mail, significant families. OK, yes. maybe they're in the auto parts industry. I don't know. Um, <laughs> that are fighting on the front page of the Globe and Mail. We think, well, this is this is just the way families are. Yeah. First generation makes it. Yeah. Second one maintains it. Yeah. Yeah. Third one blows it. Yeah. Right. Shirt yeah. sleeves to shirt sleeves. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. in Asia, rice paddy to rice paddy. Yeah. I'm in South Africa speaking. Yeah. It's the Dutch heritage, clogs to clogs. All around the world, yeah. there is some version of, of that arc. And the reality is, it's nonsense. There yeah. are lots of families who communicate to the next generation what is coming their way. Yeah. And instead of it just being a blank check and a winning the lottery, yeah. they spend a lot of time preparing yeah. the next generation yeah. to take that wealth and deploy it in a respectful way, in a healthy way, in a productive yeah. way. Yeah. And, and I, I, there's just lots of families where the second generation has taken a, a significant inheritance yeah. and doubled it and quadrupled it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So this, so this this idea that inherited wealth will always destroy the beneficiary. It, it is a, it's a weird idea. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. So I think that's uh, this is a great point, right? Is uh, 
something i can't remember the actual quote but you you kind of write something about it being fun and you just mentioned it and referenced it there so i mean i think that's this is a great point is you know that is there's a way that maybe you can think about it from the perspective of you know this can be a fun environment this can be an opportunity to have conversations with your kids or grandkids saying you know, there is some money here you know you have a business idea you have something that you're working on there's opportunities for you that you might not be aware of that that could be elaborated on and discussed in the meetings i think that's a great point that you make yeah, it's especially, um, I know that we want to get back and uh, I think in the new year and talk about for business, do what, do one of these specifically for business owners, yeah. but a little, a little hint, a lot of business owners have uh, kept their wealth inside the retained earnings of their operating business. Uh, and of course, bad things happen to business owners all the time. Look sure. at uh, Tony Shea, the uh, founder of, uh, of Zappos, yeah. right? $600 million estate, no will, like good luck sorting that at Prince. Prince, yeah, uh, yeah. Prince, yeah. there's still six hundred million dollar estate. Like, again, there's Aretha Franklin. She had yeah. pancreatic cancer. Yeah. She knew she was dying six weeks. Still, yeah. no will. Like, yeah. what are people waiting? You see how frozen people are when it comes to this subject. Yeah, and and I just I don't know. They just don't have. I don't think they have advisors like you who are yeah. spending the time educating their clients about how crucial these documents are. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a great point. And I think uh, as as I meet with people, obviously, the conversation always comes up about the will and the estate and what's happening with the next generation. I think that uh, there's probably a, a lot of fear still with what happens next. And uh, some of what I've seen is there's, you want to control things afterwards. There's this controlling thinking that people want to want to have. So what kind of, what advice would you have, I guess, to, to people thinking about wanting to control where everything goes and maybe, maybe some, uh, some thoughts around that. Yeah, I, I, you know, the great, uh, the greatest example of control from the grave were, were the Egyptian pharaohs who buried themselves surrounded by their gold and their servants. <laughs> and it's like, it did not go well. Yeah, yeah. It did right. not go well. Those yes. tombs were raided. You can't take it with you. Yes. But I think, I think what I'm saying is that, and, you know, and I have, uh, I have a daughter who, uh, who, who's in the healthcare field and I know lots of friends who are working acute care and emergency and yeah. they don't know anyone who is aging and dying. Who's talking about whether or not they should have bought or sort sold Nortel sooner. No one is talking about money as yes. they hear the end. You know what they're always talking about? They're talking about family. They're yeah. talking about relationships. They're talking yeah. about the things that ultimately matter. And yeah. I think what I'm trying to do is say, look, that is the important stuff. And so yeah. how do you invest in those relationships? How do we take the fear of dying and aging? Yes. Well, I can tell you the way that we do that is that we don't, we make it a collaborative journey. I think what makes aging so scary is that we feel like we're, we're going to be warehoused in some institution all by ourselves. It's going to be this solo, dark, scary journey. And I'm saying yeah. it doesn't have to be yeah. by having family meetings and asking, I mean, I know yeah. exactly where our parents want to live as they yeah. age. I want yeah. to know how they want to age. Yes. I've asked them very specific questions. Yeah. I know what they want. Yeah. And they have shared with me what is coming my way. Right. It's the same conversation. Sure. And I think there might be some people today who are saying, well, I've got parents, but they don't want to talk about money. Their culture is, they just don't talk about it. What I would say to them is, yeah. Get your will written and yes. share a copy of your will with your parents. It's weird that we, that we parent our parents on a subject that they should be leading on. Right. In many cases, you might have clients or people listening where they're the first generation of, of wealth. Yeah. In other words, their parents never really made estate planning a yeah. priority because there really wasn't much to divide. Right. There was no need for family meetings. Yep. There was some money, little money left over at the end, chopped four ways, two kids, two ways, whatever. It, was, it wasn't a big deal. Yeah. But now we have a generation of Canadians, the yes. most successful generation of wealth creators, 
Yeah. And they're looking into their own family history for clues on how to manage their estate and prepare their family. There's nothing there. Yeah. There's yeah. nothing there in their history. Right. So what I'm saying is if you're a first, first generation wealth creator, yeah. I'm listen to me very carefully. You, there is nothing in your family. Don't look to your history. Right. You have to lead on this subject. Builder. You have to embed and start new family traditions that yeah. teach your kids about what wealth is and what it is. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's really what I'm trying to do is resurrect that idea of what it means to be a matriarch and patriarch. They yeah. sound like old fashioned words. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. matriarch. I don't, mat matriarchal, patriarchal. I'm not a Rockefeller. It's like, yeah, no, yeah. if you're going to die with surplus wealth, even yes. after your long term care costs have been factored in, you know you're going to leave wealth. You really have a duty to prepare people because it will impact their lives. Yeah, certainly, certainly. So, um, you know, this has been awesome, Tom. I think uh, we've had some, had some great conversations here. One thing I'd like you to maybe talk a bit about before we see if there's some, some more questions come through is the Willing Wisdom Index that you've created. What is it? How do you use it? What, you know, what comes at the end of that? Maybe you can tell me a bit about that. Well, I, uh, I know that uh, you've subscribed to, to this. Uh, so I developed this tool uh, and you're making it available to your clients so that yep. no, at no yep. charge to them. Nice. Um, normally, if someone wanted to access this tool, it's $200. So I know this is a great gift that you're giving your clients. This is the ultimate estate planning checklist. Okay. It, is, it takes a staggering eight minutes of someone's life. So it's eight <laughs> minutes. If you don't have eight minutes to spare, don't do this. But if, if you have eight minutes... Yeah. to find out what the gaps are in your estate plan or what the opportunities are to really improve the things and do the things that I've been talking about. Yeah. So it, yeah, it takes eight minutes, click, click, click. It's a digital tool. You can, if you can operate, if you can send an email, you can yeah. get, you can do this. Yeah. Eight minutes, you'll immediately get this beautiful 20 page report that will help you start family conversations make major decisions about who you want to select as your executor, your power of attorney. And so when you go visit your lawyer, yeah. you will have done a lot of your own work yeah. because of this tool. This tool will make that easy. Mm -hmm. So instead of your meeting with your lawyer being three hours, yeah. it will be 30 minutes. Now, how do lawyers charge? <laughs> by the hour. Yes. By indeed. the hour. So, <laughs> Yeah. Short meetings with lawyers, very yeah. good. Yes. Long meetings, very bad. This tool will help you shorten those meetings. They'll be more productive. You'll end up with a better, better will, better power of attorney, better healthcare directive, short, quick. Yeah. Uh, you're going to save some money. Yeah, excellent. Awesome. That's a really great tool. Yeah, uh, it's going to be good for multi-generations too, right? Everyone can complete it and, and see where they are in the process. And I would note, totally confidential so no last name is required yep. uh, when you send the link to this to get this to access this tool people can enter their first name no last name yep. uh, or make up a screen name seriously this yep. is common no one wants to know your results no one cares sure Not that yep. no one cares yeah, it's just yeah. that what i what we know is that if people feel like they got to put the right answer in to impress someone yeah we know bad data in yeah. bad data out yeah. Honest, good, yeah. intentioned answers in. Yes. Phenomenal report out. You're going to get recommendations that yeah. speak directly to you and yeah. how to make your estate plan awesome. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's good. So, so apparently, Elvis is a very popular name, which, you know, a lot of people complain. <laughs> it's like Elvis, Elvis. Yeah. So, seriously, make up a screen name, um, but yeah. do it and you're yeah. going to love it. Yeah, for sure. I went through it. Uh, it's definitely a good, uh, good experience to take yourself through, even if you think you're all set and you've, you've done what you need to do. I think uh, it, it certainly is an eye opener. So I've had a few questions come through. I think you've answered a lot of them as we've, we've kind of gone through the process. Um, you know, I would like you, I have actually had a couple of questions around doing your own wills. I mean, you did reference earlier that you should deal with a lawyer. Um, maybe a few more comments because I've had a couple of questions around that. Yeah, so a holographic will is a handwritten yeah. will, and a yeah. lot of people will do these, uh, particularly if they're 
going on a long vacation, particularly if they're traveling with a spouse. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, a lot of people will grab a scrap of piece of paper, like some amazing things have been, have been uh, uh, written down and submitted sure. to, the, uh, to the probate court as a, as a legal will. Yeah. They're legal. Yeah. The shortest will in Canada, uh, I don't know if you know this, was by Cecil Harris in 1948. He was uh, a farmer in Saskatchewan. He got uh, stuck under his tractor. He got his tractor stuck in a field, got off, found himself trapped, uh, and, and he, was, he knew he was dying. And he took a pen knife out of his pocket and he carved into the fender of his tractor, in case I don't get out of this mess, I leave everything to the wife. <laughs> Couple of, a couple of lessons to be learned. Um, timing your estate plan like that, it's not yeah. like an oil change where we know when we're going to need one. I mean, yes. he was incredibly lucky. They yes. cut that fender off the tractor, submitted it to the probate court. To this day, it sits in the law museum in uh, Saskatchewan it, and as the shortest will in Canada. <laughs> a lot of people aren't so lucky. And the other, yeah. of course, lesson is uh, never refer to your wife as the, the wife. wife. <laughs> it, it does beg the question that there are others. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, that, that I've learned myself. You definitely never do that. <laughs> never, never do that. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but no, the holographic wells are, are legal. Yep. I just really dissuade people. Sometimes we can mess, we can mess those up. As I said earlier, yeah. if you have a beneficiary witness a yeah. will, it's, it's, a, it's null and void. Yeah. Uh, seriously, go to a lawyer. There's lots of stuff people don't know that they don't know yeah. about estate planning. And yeah. Um, yeah, this is really a seriously important document to get right. Yeah. So a few more questions really around, I guess, how, how probate works, which uh, we can comment on in a sec, but I do want to ask more of the executor. Um, you know, uh, typically, have you seen that it makes sense to name one executor, multiple executors, any opinions around that or best so practices? We, we, uh, we had a good family friend who was particularly good at administrative details, uh, but we just replaced him with his knowledge with our two kids who okay. are equal beneficiaries of our estate. So I think they're, they're both, one's a business, Western business grad, the other one is in healthcare. They're super competent. We've had lots of family meetings. They're the equal beneficiaries. We made that change. And they're, they're gonna be great at that job because I know what's involved. Okay. The answer is always in the room. My family is not your family. Your family is different from that family over there and over there. We're all different. The yeah. answer is to who you select as your executor or yeah. executors. Yeah. The answer to that question is in the room. Got it. And Got it, it resides somewhere between the relationship between yourself and your kids. And it may be that no one wants that duty hmm. um, because, because a professional trustee would be better suited. Or, uh, for example, my brother and I were co-executors of my parents' estate. He, yeah. he now lives in the U.S. We had to take him off. Sure. Right? Or else my parent, Canadians, yeah. estate would be subject to the IRS. Yeah. They would have, it would have been subject to U.S. law. Yeah. So this is not somewhere. This is not an area that you want to mess around with. The, yeah. the implications yeah. can be staggering if we get it wrong. Get good advice. Pay yeah. for it. Yeah. So I did have another question about trustee because you mentioned trustees there. Yeah. Um, so when you say that, obviously, trust companies, there's trust codes at the banks. There's independent trust companies. Um, and uh, sometimes that's appropriate for people. Um, do they have to have a trust or like, where would they bring the trustee in just to manage the estate? Maybe some, yeah, some just, comments. Just would, they, could, they could have it to, to obviously to manage a trust uh, yeah. or they could just be the executor, the trustee of the estate, which is the executor uh, role. Sure. Um, I often get the question where I thought you were going is I often get the question is when is it appropriate to use a trust? Yeah. Not just for tax reasons, like why would we use a trust? And as a, as a general rule, mm -hmm. uh, this will be helpful. Yes, for sure. We often call things that they're not. So if you're wondering if you should use a trust, it's usually when there is a lack of yeah. trust. For sure, of course. <laughs> right? If there's a concern like in a relationship or there's maybe someone is too young Yep. Like if you die tomorrow in a catastrophic car accident and yep. your 22 year old is going to get $8 million, like that's yep. just, that could be catastrophic for them. 
Yeah. So you would create a trust because there's a lack yeah. of trust. You would yeah. create a trust to help meter out that money or a trustee would have, you know, guidelines to help them disperse that funds over time or under various conditions if they're met. Like yeah. that is, that's what you do. Like you're really good at, as an advisor, you're really good at guiding people. There's a lot of people who are thinking, we've got to be the only family in, in Ottawa who's yeah. got this concern. Like, sure. Yeah. No. Families, no, no. Are, they're all, families are all at some level, they're all chaotic and they're all broken. <laughs> they're, <laughs> families are complex. And For that's, sure. and, and smart families use advisors like yourself and, yeah. the, and to guide them through that maze of trust. And there's lots of different kinds of trust. So would a trust be built into the will? Is this a separate document or how would, how, would, how does that work? Trust can be created inside the will, can, okay. be, can be inside or outside the will, can be created on, on, on death. Yeah, um, yeah there's, it, that's of all the areas of estate planning, trusts I think are where people can really benefit from good advice. Yeah. They don't have to be trust experts, yeah. but they have to know what they don't know. And that is, lean on someone like yourself to help navigate their way through that world of trust. So with the change to the trust rules in the last, well, okay, say probably five years, are people still using spousal trust? Is that something still part of the planning process? I, I think it depends on the province. Um, yeah. And, and again, yeah. it depends also, also where they have assets. Do they have, sure. you know, vacation homes in the U S yep. should they have a will a, yep. a Florida will for their U S assets? Let's again, you can ignore this yeah. <laughs> and, and really create great complexities for your beneficiaries. I tell people, if you ignore this issue, you will be remembered. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just not fondly. <laughs> yeah. So that's a good one about the U S real estate. So maybe, you know, for, cause I know some clients own some U S real estate. So maybe you can briefly give me 30 seconds on that. Yeah. Well, my 30 seconds would be get a lawyer. And get okay. really good. Get a lawyer um, who either has an affiliate office in Florida who understands Florida law, okay. or Colorado law, wherever that wherever that second home is or that asset is. Yeah. Do not mess around with this stuff. Mm -hmm. If you think a five thousand dollar will or a three thousand dollar will or a fifteen hundred dollar will is expensive, yeah, that is like that is like a rounding error for some of the tax that can be triggered by a poorly drafted or absent document that can that can get right a family well organized yeah and like it's one thing just to write the will yeah a lot of people can't put their hands on the will like they don't it's it's in some safety deposit box but no one has the key or the combination right. or doesn't even know it's existed like yeah and that's really what coming back to the willing wisdom index right it's really about bringing the transparency it's like For okay sure. Yeah. And have a conversation about who the executor is, yeah. but okay, now it's you because we've had this family conversation. Okay, now you executor, yeah. here is everything you need. Here's yeah. what you do on the day that I die. Yeah. Here's your roadmap to the passwords. Yeah. Do you know that I still get email notifications from a, a friend who died four years ago asking <laughs> me to wish him happy birthday on LinkedIn? I'm like, I know the family doesn't know how to shut it off. They, they can't. They don't know his password. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great one. You, you gave me a lot there. I'd say first off, uh, you know, I do have a guide, a password guide that uh, that uh, that clients could have if they're interested, where they can keep and put everything together. So certainly we can come back on that. Um, but uh, you know, you and I have a pretty good understanding of U.S. estate law risk. Maybe you can give me a little bit of comments. I know you you referenced it there, but you know, maybe give give me an example of what what happens if uh, uh, you don't have a second will or you don't have it set up properly what, what's what's the risk well uh, in very very broad strokes yeah. i think there's a lot of canadians who are uh really broadsided by by u.s estate law there's a there's a saying that in the u.s it's much easier to to create wealth lower tax rates uh just just easier to amass wealth but yeah. i'll tell you uncle sam Boy, when you're dead, that is a completely different story. You got to remember in the U.S., Americans, and this pains me as a Canadian to say this, but Americans are so far out in front of Canadians when it comes to estate planning because 
right. historically and culturally, the IRS has mopped the floor with people who are ill prepared. And there's a second layer of taxation in the US, right? There's capital gains tax and there's a death tax, right? right? Now that death tax is at a high threshold right now, around $11 right. million. Yeah. But, but that goes up and down over time. And there's just, there's a great cynicism and weariness of Uncle Sam and the yeah. IRS. Yeah. And that drives people to, to lean on advisors. And be, they're, they're way more aggressive users of trust than Canadians yeah. are. Canadians sure. are like, you know, we got capital gains. It's like, yeah. Yeah. It actually is easier to transition wealth to Canada than it is the U.S. Right? Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. Really yeah. easier. Yeah. Harder to make wealth in Canada because we get taxed, Tax. like, yeah. you know, aggressively all the way along. Yeah. Uh, but I think there are Canadians with, with assets in the U.S. that are completely out to lunch, completely yeah. out to lunch. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they're going to learn some really hard lessons the hard way. Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I, I, uh, the, the conversation has gone a bit, little bit different than I expected. I mean, it's really a lot about the, the communication, about the family meetings. Um, you know, the book is excellent, and I'm sure all the clients are going to enjoy going through that. Um, but really, it is. It's about communicating what you what you'd like to see happen, really communicating your family values. Um, that's really not talked about a lot. So I think uh, you make a, a lot of great points around that, these family meetings. Um, you know, I've, uh, I've tried them myself on and off and haven't been super consistent with the kids. My kids are still young, but uh, I think these are, these are great conversations to have. And, uh, you know, one of the things I'd asked you before was when do you start? And you said you started them very young. So, I mean, this yeah. is, I think, a, an amazing point that it can happen immediately. And, you know, in our family meetings, uh, you know, when our kids and our family meetings turn 18, hmm. we, we take some of our family wealth and we start to transition it to the next generation. Like we don't hoard our wealth. Interesting. To the very end. Yeah. And die in our 80s and our kids are in their 60s and they get, you know, lots of money and you know, when they it's precisely when they don't need it. Yes, yes. We, yes. we, we with the help of our advisors, mm -hmm. we make relatively small gifts at 18 mm -hmm. and, and, and infrequent. But yeah. as they get older, the gifts become larger yeah. and more frequent yeah. and more material. Yes. And all along, especially with those early gifts, yeah. We're measuring, yeah. we're watching, yeah. we're coaching those yeah. living gifts. Yeah. We're, we're emphasizing and introducing them to our advisors. And our advisors are working with our kids to teach them about investing. And sure. the power of some sophisticated concepts like the power of compounding interest yeah. <laughs> that, we, that most people don't talk to their kids about. For like sure. and deferred, do you need a use? Do you really need a, a new car? Yeah. Or would a good, safe used car? Yeah. Right? Would yeah. that... With, so that stuff is, that's what we're talking about in our family meetings at, at the yeah. early age. Then we yeah. graduate from that stuff. Sure. But the, by the time our kids get into the thirties and forties, yeah. like we're really, we're in our sixties and seventies. We want a big chunk of that wealth transitioning to them. Surplus wealth, stuff that we don't need. Right. Right. Uh, Cause when we're, and I've watched it. I've watched my great, uh, my grand, well, my great grandparents and my grandparents, mm -hmm. um, as they got into their seventies, they were getting rid of what I, would what I would describe as hard to divide assets. They were moving art and things, cottages, boats. They were moving, they're getting rid of it and moving to cash. Cash in the estate is really easy to divide. Yeah, yeah. Try taking a pair of scissors and dividing a boat seven ways, a cottage seven ways, a business nine ways. Yeah. So I watched it. Yeah. I've watched how we, we liquidate those hard to divide, those kinds of assets that are going to cause problems. Yeah. Move to cash. Yeah. Have you ever met anyone who has received cash at the, from an estate and been disappointed? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No, but I, but I have seen a lot that have had uh, cottage frustrations around who gets who and what gets, how it gets divided for sure. For sure. Uh, yeah. So, you know, maybe some, some opinion around that. I do have, have clients that ask, what do, what do I do with the cottage? How do I equalize the cottage? Yeah. So in our family meetings, what we do as we're transitioning cash, yeah. we're actually also 
right on the heels of that, asking whether or not they want to buy various physical assets okay. from the estate. Okay. Right. So when someone in our family dies, the very first thing, say there's two kids, the very first thing that gets released is yeah. cash. Because we might have a high earner and a low income earner. And yeah. so the release of cash gives the next generation liquidity to mm-hmm. buy a cottage, to yeah. buy a business, yeah. to buy that um, painting yeah. or that antique car, whatever, whatever it is in someone's estate. Yeah. And guess what? What? <laughs> Very few people do. Yes. Yeah. Very few people actually, lots of people want the cottage. Very few people want to take gifted cash and buy the cottage. They often people want things because they just don't want someone else in the family to have it. Sure. So sure. when you, if, and it's in willing wisdom, right? It's, it, that is what I'm talking about in willing wisdom. It's like, yeah. hey, if we, do, if we transition cash and then ask someone to buy the cottage, that money goes to the estate and then the cash gets divided again. So if there's two yeah. kids, you would actually get the cottage for a 50% discount. And yeah. the child who doesn't get the cottage gets yeah. gets the cash, gets more cash. Yeah. Everyone gets what they want. Sure. No fighting, no lawyers, yeah. no post-it notes underneath the plate or on the watch, you know, sticky notes, who gets what. We don't do any of that. It's it's clear, transparent, and business-like. Yeah. So uh, I mean, this isn't exactly long where we've been talking, but often I've seen a last, we'll call it four or five years, Clients have started to move money towards, we'll say, joint accounts with parents and things like that. Any opinions from you around uh, them doing that? Um, uh, maybe some comments around that, because I get that question often. Yeah, I would just, I, 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 it's often done sometimes just for one child to, so that they can pay bills. They can be just like for practical administrative matters, pay yep. phone bills. If someone loses capacity, just, just be mindful that if you're making, you know, someone joint on an account that, that there's a family meeting and it's well communicated because often if it's not, and someone finds out after a parent dies that yeah. someone was joint on an account and yeah. was using it a little bit as their own personal piggy bank. Um, that's, yeah. that's often how an estate gets started. The administration like it gets started on the wrong foot. Yeah. So whatever you decide, again, it's the communication piece that's so important, but also those joint accounts can also be important for creating some liquidity when yeah. someone dies for yeah. pay, you know, the final terminal tax return, there may be taxes owing, right? Having that liquidity, designing it that way, setting your executor up again, it's a yeah. recurring theme sure. to succeed. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Oftentimes, yeah, I mean, you've talked about power of attorney a number of times around financial and health. Uh, oftentimes, uh, I've found that clients don't understand that the second the, the individual passes away, those are null and void again. And so there's a, there's a big gap between then and when an estate gets settled. Um, so it's a definite planning opportunities around how to prepare for that. Yeah, you can see the advantages of families who rely on on advisors like yourself, as opposed to those, uh, you know, those commercials we're watching on TV, those do-it-yourselfers, day traders. Yeah, it's like <laughs> no one knows where anything is. It is sure. a complete and utter disaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, part of why I liked uh, your point seven, do you, uh, as your family, and have you seen others, is there a typical, even if there's been plenty of communication, but uh, hypothetically say there's not as much communication as you have because you're, you've been unique and you've, you've, uh, you've followed the process that's been developed over many years for you and your family, you know, would somebody go about writing their wishes, we'll say on top of their will potentially, would you, something to be read to, to the families, have you seen that? Yeah, something to be read and something to be discussed because often kids will be like, I know this is your wish, <laughs> and you want me to give your eulogy, but I'm terrified. I'm terrified of public speaking. Is there some other way that you just celebrate celebrate your life? Like, like, there's a lot of things where I think when we're really mindful of our relationships, we end up with better estate plans, better relationships, and really healthy families. 
yeah. when we can conquer our fear of death and get yeah. and get these things discussed and implemented. Yeah. Um, and, and I would be really remiss if I didn't cover this point before we wrap up. Yeah. Uh, we, we think that estate planning is just for old people. Right. Absolutely. And I'm reminded of that. I just I watched in horror that Humboldt bus crash on the prairies a couple of years back. And I knew that there were kids that were over 18 on that bus. And I knew that parents, their parents were arriving at the local hospital and asking about how their kids were doing. And I knew that they would be bumping into the privacy laws. And if they didn't have a, the child's health care directive and they were over 18, they were getting no information on their children's well-being. Wow. Nothing. Wow. Wow. They would get as much as you and I. Yeah. So anyone listening today, you want to give yourself a really great gift? Yeah. Buy your kids a will, power of attorney, healthcare directive if they're over 18. Yeah. These are great lifelong documents. Nothing yeah. says that we die in order or that it's yeah. just old people that have to worry about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Serious yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Look, I, uh, I think uh, this has been awesome, Tom. I appreciate you taking all the time with us today, sharing your experiences. As I say, you know, this has really been about your, this, this family meeting concept that you've done so expertly over the years. Um, you know, clients are, we're going to send, send the book along and uh, may have some questions more that come out of that. But uh, this family meeting uh, idea is a way to really bring the family together. And it's, uh, I don't think there's a better time than, you know, we're in this COVID environment. We're in this spot where, you know, we, we have to be around close family. We want to connect to this way. I mean, I think this is a great opportunity and a great time for us to be doing something like this. I, I think it really is. And, uh, you know, anyone who has either been in business or is an investor, how do we make money? We take measured risks. Yeah. What am I talking about? Taking a measured risk with your most valuable asset. It's your family. Yeah. Start a conversation that feels a little bit awkward. And I'll tell you, your first meeting will be okay. Your second one, a little bit better. Your third one, pretty good. Your fourth one, pretty amazing. <laughs> that is family leadership. That is how great families are built one meeting at a time. And I'll tell you, they'll, I, your family, you're going to give them a great gift that they'll never forget. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. I'm just going to see if we got any more questions. Uh, if anyone has any more questions, this is the last, uh, last call before we jump off here, but uh, I've really enjoyed the conversation. Um, I've learned some things today as well. I think the, the willing wisdom index, which we'll, uh, we'll send out after this is going to be very insightful for, for people. And, uh, let me see. I think, I think we're good for now, Tom. Thanks uh, very much for your time. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for having me. I, you're a great host, great questions. Thank you. Thanks. I look forward to seeing you again. Thanks very much. Sure. Bye now. Have a good day. Take care.